Hello, everyone. Welcome to Kissing Frogs, Conducting a Job Search. This is the third of our four webinars in the Professional Power Up series. I'm Becky Pacone, and my colleague Michelle Cavalcanti and I will be your hosts for today. And Michelle will be monitoring the Q&A session after the presentation. We're very happy that you joined us today, and I'd like to introduce Barbara Grossman and Jay Berger, the amazing duo who make up Headhunter on Tap. Hi, Barbara and Jay. Hey guys. Hi everyone. We should introduce it. If you if you know us from the, from the past, welcome back. If you don't know us, thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to jump right into this because we have a lot to cover today, and we want to field as many questions as we can today. If we don't get to your questions today, please join us Friday for job talk. It's a little bit more of a leisurely hour of being able to field questions and go into more depth. So without further ado. As with just about every one of our webinars so far, we like to start at a high level and then begin to drill down. So starting at a high level, and actually starting in general, a good place to start is the beginning. And by the beginning, I mean, what's the goal? What do you want to achieve with this move? I think that's very, very important. And I'm going to give you a tip at the end before we go to the next slide of something to remember that a lot of people lose sight of. So what do we hope to achieve? Or what do you hope to achieve with this move? That's going to be critical to driving the direction you take and ultimately the decisions you make moving forward. If you joined us for our first webinar about making transitions, we went into great detail about differentiating want versus need. Let me cover that again because I think it's important to go into now as you ascertain what you want to accomplish with this move. In some regard, it's pretty straightforward. Want Your wants are things that you want out of this move, things that you would like to have happen that would make you happy, would make your life perhaps more enjoyable, more satisfying, while need is something that's more critical in nature. Where it gets a bit complex is a lot of wants and needs operate on a continuum. For example, if we talk about wanting a change because you're bored where you're working right now, that may be the ultimate want. You don't necessarily need to make a change. You're being paid, you're being compensated, you're working, everything is going okay, except your level of satisfaction. Now it could be when you get to growth, which is similar that I want more growth, that may operate a little bit more on the need side because you're more worried about advancing your career. You're looking at a long-term growth strategy and that's gonna be important to getting you there. If we go to the other extreme, about the need for a job, well, if you are unemployed and you need to earn a living to pay your bills, then a job is the ultimate need. You may be in a situation where you have children and you wanna be closer to home, so hours or location are quite important. Definitely that falls towards the need side of things, but that can be mitigated because location and hours may not be a critical need if you're making enough money that you could have daycare and not need to be as available for your children's welfare. So if you created a line with want being all the way on the left and needs being all the way on the right, you could probably put these categories somewhere on that continuum or on that line based on how important they are to you in this given situation. What are we talking about with regard to these things that you're considering? Well, you're considering change because you're bored. Uh, you're looking at just personal satisfaction in what you're doing, the mission maybe of the organization. It might be personal growth where you're learning and being given greater opportunities for advancement. Your situation can be that management has changed and you're not enamored with the new people that are in charge. And so you're looking for opportunities either within or outside the organization. We can throw in location, hours, maybe even working remotely. I'm sure many of you are saying, where's salary on that list? Because that becomes incredibly important when making a job change. The next slide is totally devoted to salary, and we'll cover that in a second. As you begin to digest your wants versus needs, certain conclusions can be drawn. One is it will help determine what target companies or target opportunities you might wish to look for when you're making that job change. But another factor will be the time frame that you might need to be able to execute a successful search. In our first webinar, and if you haven't seen it, I suggest you go back and review it again. We talked a bit about a moderate change, 
versus a radical change. And when you look and review your wants versus needs, you can make a determination about how radical and how aggressive the move might be. Because the more aggressive the move might be, generally the more time you're going to have to expect it will take to be successful. It may require far more patience in finding an opportunity that might be open to your background and satisfy your needs because there'll be a need for either patience, reaching out to far more people than you thought you might need to, to finally find an opportunity that delivers on your target goal. I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar a tip that I thought might be incredibly helpful for you with regard to your job search. There are many times when I will be working with somebody on a job search and they will have a list of criteria that they're looking to satisfy at the beginning of the search and it morphs over time. What happens and what are the mistakes they make is they set a time limit on when they want to make a move. Now, sometimes a time limit is not up to your making. If a company is relocating, if the downsizing and you're out of a job, you don't have the determination as to when you can optimally make a move. Where I've seen this happen, let me give you an example. Somebody says it's March and they say, I want to make a move by the end of the summer. So in the back of their mind, by August or September, they want to be out. The time frame they stipulate is purely a want and is not driven by any outside factors whatsoever. What can begin to play out is as the summer goes along, if they are not successful in finding the right opportunity, they begin to lower the bar about what they might be open to. They may extend how far they're willing to commute. They may lessen the requirement for a certain title or level of responsibility, or even the salary and compensation that they were hoping to get by making this move. And what results is they're successful in meeting their time frame of finding a new job before the end of the summer. But ultimately, when they look back, the job they have is not that much better or different than the one that they just left. In other words, they were successful in meeting their deadline, but not successful in getting everything they wanted in making the change, ultimately leaving them less than satisfied. Turning to the salary, as my colleague Barbara said in an earlier webinar, everybody would like to make more money. In actuality, we've had only one candidate in our, whatever, 100 years of combined <laughs> executive search who actually requested taking less money. She received an offer for a company and an opportunity she was very interested in. The offer actually was a raise on what she was making. But when she sat down and did the accounting, she realized that that offer was $2,000 more than would allow her to qualify for a subsidized housing, which she enjoyed immensely and actually saved her tens of thousands of dollars. So she requested that the hiring company pay her $2,000 less. Now, that is a rather extreme example. So let's get back to your situation, probably. My guess is most of you would like to make more money. The key is keeping money in perspective. A lot of people will think that more money means more appreciation. It means that you're more valued as an employee. It can also give a false sense of growth when basically you're not growing as far as skills are concerned, but you're only growing as far as salary or compensation. And sometimes it's sad to say that people use it as a Band-Aid, cover up a sense of personal insecurity, that if I'm making a lot more money, I'll feel much better about myself. And in reality, it only puts more pressure on people, which gets us back to that list that we constructed at the beginning of this, looking at what our priorities are and measuring the results of our search against that criteria. If salary trumps a job change because of growth, or new management, or personal satisfaction, or even location and hours, opting for a bigger salary is oftentimes a sugar high. And if the salary isn't game-changing, you end up cashing the first couple paychecks and are still in a situation where you're left less than happy. So now you know what you want and or need to accomplish with this move. The next step is level of commitment you're willing to make to accomplish this. Let's cover four levels of commitment as we've defined them. Being open. When we look at candidates, we often will define them either as being passive or active with regard to a search. I think the statistics out there say that 70% of people currently employed are either passively or actively involved in contemplating a next move. Being open means that you are happy where you are. Things are going along fine. 
and they're not actively pursuing new opportunities. Yes, we define it as being open because we think you should always listen to at least what somebody might have to say. You never know when an opportunity is going to present itself that is just so extraordinary that you would say yes no matter what. And the good news about pursuing things when you're in this situation of being open is there's very little pressure on you. Basically, you can walk away at any given time, go back to the situation that you're in and be quite happy. Yet we encourage to being open because you never know when an opportunity of a lifetime may present itself. And it doesn't always present itself when you need it. Oftentimes it presents itself when you're not looking for it. Let me do some math here. Basically, if you are looking for an opportunity, you are looking for an opportunity within a confined period of time, let's say two to three months. That means the great opportunity would have to come along within two or three months. If you are being open in a passive candidate, it may be years between interviews. And obviously, a fantastic opportunity would be more likely to occur over the course of several years than a narrow period of a couple months. Being open requires very little commitment to time for the most part. Basically, what we would recommend is that you always code your LinkedIn profile to being open, which would have more people reach out to you. Barbara's going to cover that a little bit later on. Short of that, if there are inquiries and asks made of you about potential opportunities, you can dictate whether you want to pursue it or not. And as a result, you control the amount of time and energy you want to expend. Browsing is a notch below that. People have a tendency to browse. Perhaps they had a bad day. They're looking to avoid work on a Friday and say, ah, let me, let me kill some time. Let me see what else is out there. You might want to explore what potentially is out there, just keeping track of your career opportunities. Or maybe there's some rumblings of changes that might be occurring internally or externally within your firm. So occasionally you will check things out. You're spending several hours looking at job boards or maybe even checking into companies that you have a high level of interest in. Committed means you've already decided that you need to make a move. Let me dial that back a set and say you want or need to make a move. You know that you're bored where you are and you're looking for more growth or challenge. It could be a matter of money where you do want an increase and feel that you're underpaid based on the rest of the workforce. Management has changed and you're not happy in the new role, you are ready for just a new opportunity for excitement. You're bored where you are. So perhaps you're returning to the workforce after caring for children or a parent or ailing relative. If you are still working, well, this is an extra commitment to your day job. Essentially, your day job is continuing in the role that you're in, providing hopefully excellent service to the company that you're working for. But on top of that, you're taking time in the evenings or on weekends to look through job boards, get your resume out there, and be active in the search process. Along with networking, of course, with people that you know from your past or new people that you come into contact with. And lastly, we get to urgent. Urgent means that you are unemployed or given notice that your job will be no longer there and you'll be laid off, and you have to spend your entire time looking for a new position. That means a full-time commitment to looking for your next role. No matter what your level of commitment is to making a change, Investing a little bit of time in being prepared will have you more able to seize the opportunity. And for many, preparing before you need to be prepared comes more easily and results in a more positive evaluation of your needs and wants. Three things to look into with regard to preparation. Priorities, which we've already covered, are essentially making that list of wants and needs and determining what you want to accomplish in making this move. Transferable knowledge we also covered in an earlier webinar having to do with making transitions. And basically, a transferable knowledge is a combination of the business experience you've picked up and the skills you've developed to be able to execute on the roles that you've been in. Business experience includes specific industry knowledge, whether it's banking, investments, manufacturing, consumer products, advertising, Petrochemical engineering, you kind of get the picture of what I'm getting at right now, right? On top of that, we're talking about the roles that you have within these organizations. You might have been an accountant, you might have been a financial analyst, you might have been a computer person, a technical person, you might have been in engineering, HR, or marketing. Each of these are skills knowledge and experience knowledge that are transferable, in some cases, to the same industry or outside of your industry. Understanding transferable skills 
will enable you to be more flexible about stretching beyond certain areas where you feel somewhat confined, perhaps within a particular industry itself. And do note some of your inherent skills, whether you are a strong communicator, like being able to make presentations, have strong writing skills, are somebody who's big on team building. These are core attributes, which leads into the last piece of our trio here of professional narrative. We went into a deep dive in professional narrative in our last webinar having to do with creating an authentic resume. And I would urge you to review that if you want to know a little bit more about professional narrative. Your professional narrative is a combination of your core attributes, traits that are inherent to you that you bring to the table when you take on any task or situation. And we add on to that your journey, both your professional and personal journey, which informs where you think from and how you go about handling tasks and situations. That results in your value statement in general. It's how you go about doing what you do day in and day out. Armed with your priorities, your transferable knowledge and your professional narrative, you're ready to do some of the more practical steps of updating your resume. We talk a lot about resumes in the last webinar and I'd ask you to review that. We suggest several resumes because normally you're applying for different types of positions. You wanna update your LinkedIn profile so it is current. You wanna make it attractive to those people and as, especially as a passive candidate and somebody who's not actively looking, a current and attractive LinkedIn profile will have people reach out to you. We have actually had several candidates who've been hired into positions who never had to put together a resume. They were hired strictly on the basis of their LinkedIn profiles. And with your resume and LinkedIn profile ready to go, you want to have your profile open to be reviewed by interested parties. This is a good time for me to turn this over to Barbara. Barbara's going to talk to you a lot about LinkedIn profiles and how to code things appropriately. Thanks, Jay. With that overview, we're now going to focus on some of the more detail-oriented or what I call blocking and tackling aspects of going through a job search or a career transition. And since LinkedIn profiles are your virtual representations to the world, that seems like the best place for us to start. Now that your resume is in order, you've got that duck in a row, it's time to really focus on this LinkedIn profile piece. Oftentimes, we know that people are now even hired directly from LinkedIn profiles. Resumes may or may not even be viewed or potentially are only viewed at a late stage of the process. Similarly, if your resume is the first thing someone sees very frequently, they will go directly to your LinkedIn profile to check that out. So it's important for you to sync it to your resume, make sure it aligns with your resume, and to make sure that it is set up in a way that optimizes your success in finding a new position. The goal of the LinkedIn profile, in addition to representing you well and presenting a first good impression to the world, is to make sure that you're findable to people who are looking for people. And to that end, we absolutely encourage you to code your profile open. LinkedIn allows you to do this in two very different ways. The first way, as you can see from this slide, which has my profile up here as an example, is to code yourself open to all LinkedIn members. And that's when you get that little green collar around your profile photo. Arguably, LinkedIn could have done a better job on the aesthetics with this, but in truth, it is a very effective mechanism to let people know that you're open. When Jay and I are doing searches and we see this, it tells us right away that this individual will most likely be receptive if we reach out to them with a new opportunity. On the other hand, if you're currently working at a position or in a career transition that you know is going to take some time, and you really don't want everyone in the world to know that you're open, particularly the people you work with, LinkedIn allows you to code your profile open to recruiters only. And what that actually means is it is open to anyone using the recruiter platform, which is the platform that we use to do searches. I know in our case, our personal platform and our recruiter platform absolutely don't speak to each other. There's a firewall up between them. 
So for most of you, if you're using a personal platform and most of the people you know are using that platform, this allows only people using a recruiter platform to view you as open to work. And it's not immediately obvious. It comes up in two different ways. If we put in a search parameter that requests only people open to work, you will come up in that search. And on your profile, it actually will say to us that you are coded to open, not to everyone, just to us. We've heard some resistance to this with the concern that, are you sure someone from my company in HR won't see it? LinkedIn does say that they do their best to ensure that. In all the years that we've been using LinkedIn, which is since its inception, we have yet to hear of someone who's run into a problem with that. It seems to be pretty reliable, and we would encourage you, therefore, to use that when, in fact, you are open to work but don't want everyone in the world to know. In addition, you can indicate the job titles that you are interested in. And here, we encourage you to use as many as you possibly can that would fit for you. And as we've spoken about, use functional titles in addition, perhaps, to an actual title so that you're broadly including all types of jobs that may be appropriate for you. When it comes to job location, which they're going to require you also add, we suggest you go as broad as possible. On my profile here, you can see I've used Hampton, Connecticut, which is incredibly specific. For some people, their location is very specific. They want to be close to where they live or close to a particular location. And that's perfectly fine. But for those of you who are open to a broader geographic area, and many people are now, especially with hybrid work situations, use the largest geography that works. I would probably, if I were in an open search, use either Connecticut or metropolitan New York. And if you're open to remote work in any way, including hybrid work schedules, I would check the box that says I'm open to remote work. Finally, it's a good idea to indicate how actively you're applying or when you're available. By checking the box, immediately I'm actively applying. People who are looking know that you won't be looking for a long start date. And that can be important. Some people have an immediate need and they want to know that you're very available. Of course, it doesn't mean that if you're on a vacation planned in two weeks that you can't take it. But in general, it does imply or indicate that you are in an active search. Okay, moving on to a broader look at how to get going. It's quite common for us to speak to people once they've actually begun a job search or a career transition. Typically, people get excited once they've made a decision to move on. They dive headfirst into going online, going straight to Google, typing in some keywords and job titles to see what's out there. And before they know it, they're putting in applications. And in short order, usually, they're figuring out that they're not getting a lot of results. And that's kind of when they reach out to us or we wind up meeting with them and they're frustrated. And our advice in every one of these situations is to just take a step back. And while we recognize that there is usually some anxiety attached to making a change and people kind of want it to be over with, so they go into it quickly in the hopes of getting through it quickly, and being on the other side of it, which is completely natural and understandable. Unfortunately, it almost always does lead to some frustration that I think can be avoided, at least in part, by taking a step back and making yourself a game plan. It's not really that dissimilar from taking the time to do an outline before you write a paper, as we were all taught to do when we were in school. Generally speaking, in the long run, this will both save time and generate better results for you. So it consists typically of four basic parts, one of which will be a list of target companies or jobs, another of which will be somehow increasing the size of your network, the people that you want to reach out to, 
A third component will be some system for keeping track of what you do. And ultimately, the last piece will be to identify all of the tools that you may be able to use in order to find positions. Bear in mind that this is going to be more of an organic system for yourself or outline for yourself. It's something that will change over time. You'll adjust it, you'll tweak it, and maybe you'll eliminate some things that aren't working for you. Maybe you'll be adding a lot. Don't feel stuck with it, but it will serve to guide you, particularly at those times when you are feeling stopped or stuck or not sure where to go next. And with that, we'll go into each one of these in more detail. We believe that the best place to begin is to take some time to really think through what types of companies or industries or jobs you are really interested in and open to and start making a list. This could be a very specific and narrow list, or it may be extremely broad. It may consist of several parts. There are no rules. There's no right or wrong. No one's going to grade you on it, but just start thinking through where you can see yourself next. Sometimes people are in a transition, or even if you're looking for just a slightly different type of job, you're not exactly sure what jobs there even are. What are those positions? What are the titles? What might you be best suited for? In that case, you probably are going to want to start thinking about who you can speak with people you do know, people you don't know, that you may want to speak to and get information from. So start creating a list of those people. And don't feel limited here. It could be someone that you have no idea whether or not you can actually get a hold of. Put that person on the list. You just never know. One thing that we do recommend for people who have a good sense of where they want to be or what company they may want to be in next. Go to a job board, follow people or positions, and set up search alerts. Essentially, following people or positions is a passive search alert anytime on LinkedIn that they update or make a change. You'll get that served up to you in your feed. If you're following job boards, however, or looking at different job boards, most of them do let you set up search alerts and go ahead and do that. That will become a passive mechanism for you to receive new information. You won't have to actively seek it out or look for it. It will be coming to you and it keeps you sort of going. It provides some momentum for you. Finally, it's a good idea to begin to identify the titles or keywords that you might use in order to execute a search. I'm going to provide you with sort of an insight from our perspective, and the flip side is going to be true for you. When we're doing a search, oftentimes we use keywords or we input titles that just don't yield us quite the results that we know we're looking for and we believe to be out there. In fact, sometimes we're sure they're out there. And what we have to do is try a lot of different keywords and titles. And sometimes it takes a little research in order to figure out what works best. We might read position descriptions from other positions. We might look at people who we know who work in a similar type of environment and see what shows up in their resumes or their LinkedIn profiles. But we simultaneously expand and hone our list of keywords and titles. And very often, the joke is sometimes we hit what we call as the mother load of results, right? Like you suddenly get this wonderful return on a search and it's unexpected. And oftentimes for us, it happens when we're pretty much most frustrated about not getting what we're looking for. Well, the same is going to be true for you. You're looking for. You may need to really tweak what words you're putting in and titles you're using in order to get the kind of results you most want. Although a lot of what you do with regard to your own job search or transition is self-initiated and self-directed and you have to do it on your own, that being said, there is a very significant component, I might even say most of what you do actually goes on out there in the world. It happens through conversations with people. 
And it's important to think about who you can speak with, who you might want to speak with, who you don't know that you can speak with, and begin making that list and setting up those conversations. Another way of talking about this is to say, build out your network. I hate using the word network because so many people are loath to do what they think of as networking. But instead, this is really about finding people to talk to, just having conversations. And in general, this will consist of people you do know and people you don't know. Don't overlook under the category of people you do know, talking with family and friends, the people that are most immediately in your circle that you see day in and day out. If you live with roommates, you may want to talk with your roommates and let them know that you've begun a new search for something. Regardless of how long you think it will take, how big a search it is, just bring people into what you're thinking about. If you run into someone at an event or a party, go ahead and mention it when it's appropriate. Of course, you don't want to mention it to people. If you are trying to keep this somewhat quiet where you do currently work, you may want to be careful at professional events. But in other circumstances, very often people meet people at conferences or at some type of association event, and that's where the next position comes from. So those are people I would put under the heading of, you might know them, you may not know them, but you're somehow connected with them and you run into them in some casual way. Don't overlook the people you commute with. If you commute, I can tell you that more than one time, I've heard about people getting a new position through someone they commute with. Someone I remember speaking with transitioned into a very different career because the person that she commuted with for years was looking for someone and kind of looked at her one day and said, you know, you'd be really good at this. He just knew that from having spoken with her through the course of years. She had never considered doing what he needed to be done. She wasn't sure she could. And she had some trepidation, mostly about her own ability, her self-confidence, but he assured her it would work out. And lo and behold, it really did. That's where she wound up excelling in her career and taking off. When it comes to people you don't know, you want to think about where you want to be or land and who might be a resource for you. We talk a lot about informational interviews. It's much easier to ask people for information. What is it about where they work that they do like or don't like? What is of interest? What types of pitfalls should you be aware of? Sometimes there are big things that are industry-wide or company-wide that you really should know about if you're considering something and you want to know about them. So you want to look for people that you can speak to as a resource. You can reach out to them through LinkedIn. You can reach out through common mutual connections. That's ideal, perhaps. A lot of times people don't mind speaking with you. Just make sure that you are specific enough in your request to speak with them so that they're motivated to respond and provide you with the answers you're looking for. When it's appropriate, you can certainly talk with colleagues. Oftentimes, previous former colleagues are a really great resource when you're looking for a new position. I was recently working with a candidate who was just someone I knew who was looking for a new position. She had just started her search. And interestingly, by coincidence, a former colleague of hers moved into a new position. She reached out to congratulate the person and they got to talking to the person said, oh, do you remember so-and-so from where we worked? And she said, yes, of course. And they both really respected this person. And she said, I'm pretty sure he's looking for someone. You'd probably be great for his team. And within a couple of weeks, she had a job offer. It all happened a lot more unexpectedly and more quickly than she would have ever imagined. It's good to think about all the groups that you're part of. I call them affinity groups because that's the word I know from universities. And of course, places from universities, whether it's a fraternity or a sorority. I belong to a women's network group of alumni within my geographic location. Could be anything, but those are all great resources. Obviously, professional associations are a natural. I already mentioned that. But don't overlook your community resources as well, whether it's a place where you get together for sports purposes as informally and casually as tennis or as formally as a hockey league that you participate in or a soccer club or a hobby, a book group, a knitting group, a gardening group, yoga. 
whatever it is that you do where you see people, don't hesitate to mention that you're open to a new search or a new position and see what might come of those conversations. Alumni associations and networks are, of course, a resource that you should take full advantage of. You paid for that education, you earned it, and you deserve to reap the benefits. So speak to those people. Again, make sure that you're targeted enough when you're reaching out to people that you don't know to ask them for something specific. So it's not an open-ended question or one where they're looking at a request saying, why is this person reaching out to me? I don't get it. Make it clear what it is that you hope to gain from a conversation. And of course, there is LinkedIn. LinkedIn obviously provides you with the ability to connect. At this point, random connections are so prevalent that people are wary of that. I do recommend if you reach out to connect with people that you send a short and clear note as to why you're reaching out to connect. I will always respond to someone directly who does that. If someone just connects with me without a message and I don't really understand why, I oftentimes don't connect and I'm motivated to have a very large group of connections and I don't do it. An overlooked resource of LinkedIn is their groups. You can join an unlimited number of groups now and we tell people join as many as you can that fit for you. People within groups are able to message one another. You'll often see people who are doing similar work to you or interested in similar things as you're interested in. And it's kind of a hidden resource that is more like a professional association than just a connection. So go ahead and build out that network in a way that isn't networking. Think of it more as just having many conversations, as many as possible. I promise you, ultimately, conversations are going to be what leads you to getting a position. Most times, it will not come from that blind application through a portal. Not that you shouldn't do that, but this is a very critical piece. For a lot of people, the whole idea of keeping track of what you do, creating a system for doing that, gives them just total anxiety. For other people, the thought of creating a tracking mechanism is right up their alley, but they have a tendency to perhaps get stuck in a little analysis paralysis. Too much tracking, not enough doing. The idea here is to find some balance, and the real goal is to make sure that you know what you've done so that you're not retracing your steps and duplicating your own efforts. It's generally helpful to keep track of all of the companies that you've reached out to or would like to reach out to. Ditto for jobs and people, same thing. You certainly want to make sure that you know who you've had conversations with and which people you want to still have conversations with. That in particular is going to be an ever evolving list. So you just want to kind of track that. It's very easy as you move forward to forget. I think I spoke to that person, but I'm not sure. It sounds familiar, et cetera. By all means, make sure to keep track of the jobs to which you've applied. You don't want to waste time applying twice. And application portals tend to be a bit cumbersome and time consuming. So you really don't want to go over your steps on that one. And make sure to note what you've done in terms of research so that you can refer back to it down the road. Ultimately, this gives you a way of knowing what your status is, sort of that checklist for what you have done. And then it does also provide you with an ongoing to-do list. A quick comment here is don't forget to send out thank you notes to people, whether they're quick text or an email or longer and more specific in the case where someone's really taken some time with you. People sometimes ask me, is that a little old fashioned? Believe it or not, I've gotten that question more than I would imagine. And the truth is it's not at all old fashioned. No one minds being thanked for their time or appreciated. But generally speaking, you kind of want to know where you've been and where you need to still go or want to still go. And that's the whole point of this. It is not to make a whole project in and of itself out of it. The little bit of hidden gold in this is down the road when you are in yet another search, and for most of you, that is really going to happen. 
if not once, multiple times in your career. The younger you are, the more likely it is going to happen more frequently at this point, because that's the rate of change that we're in in today's world. This comes sort of your own job journal and career transition journal, and you can refer to it and build on it time and again. So not only are you leveraging the time you're spending now, but you can potentially leverage the time you spend down the road as you move forward in your career. In addition to optimizing your time, you're going to want to leverage the tools you're going to use to find positions. Obviously, you're going to go to the big aggregators and places that are clear to everyone, but don't overlook taking the time to learn more about the specific tools that may be available within the company or organizations that you're looking to get into. Think about and do some research on what aggregators are out there for your particular sector. There are aggregators probably in every sector at this point, and they tend to be more fruitful than some of the larger ones because they are more narrowly driven. Think about what you can use LinkedIn for. In addition to searching for jobs, you can certainly see postings on groups. We mentioned groups before as a way of leveraging your network. You can follow people, and when people do make changes, that update will come through in your feed and you'll see not only where they've been, but where they're going to. And certainly it may identify new opportunities for you or places you hadn't thought of. The same is true for following companies. Anytime they post a new position or make a change, you will get that served up to you in your feed. So you want to leverage all of those, what I call passive tools, so that you're getting information without having to go out there and look for it. Oftentimes, people will overlook thinking about going directly to company websites. I would surely encourage you to do this. If you have an idea about what companies are of interest to you, check out their websites directly. Very often, you will see jobs posted there that you're not going to see posted elsewhere for whatever reason. They're not picked up by the aggregators and you're just not going to see them. Think about universities and what they can provide to you. In addition to posting their own jobs online, a lot of universities do have databases available for their alumni of jobs that are available. And then, of course, their alumni networks can be useful to you as well. And finally, Think about professional associations. Even if you are not a member of a professional association within your area of expertise, you can oftentimes access their job boards. They do typically make those available to the public, or often, I should say, if not typically. A couple that really come to mind that have great job boards are the Society of Information Managers, which is an IT-focused association. And the Women in Development New York chapter has an excellent nonprofit job board. You certainly do not have to be a member of their organization to access it. And the jobs are not just for women. Oftentimes, I've mentioned that to men in the nonprofit sector, and they don't even think to go look there. So there are really a lot of tools and resources out there that you're probably not thinking about. And while you don't want to overlook the obvious ones, you want to make sure to uncover others that could be very useful to you. And that about wraps up the details of blocking and tackling on this topic. I think Jay's going to land this webinar because we're close to the end. So Jay, you want to take over from here? Thanks, Barbara. That's an awful lot of information. And if any of you are feeling daunted and least, remember these are best practices. The more you can incorporate probably the more effective your search will be, but you don't necessarily need to incorporate every single thing you just heard to be successful. We want you to know everything so you can choose to do as much as you are basically capable of handling at any given time to maximize your success. Let me see if I can set up position descriptions in a way that perhaps most of us can identify. If you're in the dating world and you ask somebody, hmm, what would the ideal man or woman be? Basically, the description you would hear probably matches less than 1% of the population in the world. And the likelihood that that person would show up at any given time and be available is next to zero. 
And if you went back to the person who was describing the ideal mate and said, well, what would you want out of this person? And they said, you know what? I like somebody that I would enjoy being with who has a good sense of humor, who's kind and nice. Let's look at that from a standpoint of a job description versus the job requirements. It's remarkable how many people we talk to when we ask them what's the first thing they look at when they look at a job description that's posted online as they look at the requirements. And oftentimes, once they look at the requirements, they immediately match up every single requirement to their background and basically rule themselves out. That is not the way to go about looking for a job. When I look at a job description, I look at the description of what the job is, the overview of the company and the role and what they want this person to accomplish in that role. That tells me all I need to know. And oftentimes I will fill in the blank about what skills are necessary to be able to accomplish that job. I then move on to the job requirements to get a better sense for where the company might be coming from. And actually, in many cases, to understand whether they are being realistic in their approach, irrational, or the job requirements don't necessarily line up with what the job responsibilities would be. So note the overview of the job responsibilities and whether you think it sounds practical that you could accomplish the task that they're looking someone to perform. If it sounds exciting, get excited. All right, don't hold back at all. And then you can move to the qualifications and requirements. A couple things to remember when you look at qualifications and requirements. Oftentimes these are wish lists. We'll go back to my dating analogy in the beginning. In a perfect world, what would the background of this individual look like? And in a lot of cases, that's a guess rather than a reality. I had a situation where I was terribly frustrated with regard to a search I was conducting. There were several required pieces of technology that they said they needed, and I could not find somebody who had all of those technologies, especially one in particular. I finally approached the client and said, I can't find this person. This person doesn't seem to exist. And they came back with, well, that's fine, Jay. That's a technology we're not using right now, and we may never use it. We just thought it might be nice to have. Also, often job descriptions or requirements are geared towards how an organization or one particular organization is doing what they're doing, and it won't line up with what anybody else is doing. So they're asking for everything with the intention that if they get some of it, hopefully most of it, then that might be a viable candidate. I appreciated one of my clients who actually had a list of about 10 criteria. And they said, if you have three or more of the above, please feel free to contact us. There are other situations where the description of the person is more the conventional candidate. It's not that the hiring company wouldn't be open to, let's call it a more exotic type of background for the role. It's just to advertise for one might not be the smartest way to go about doing things because there are fewer of those exotic types of backgrounds out there. You may have the requisite exotic skills. And what I mean by exotic, I mean a different set of skills that you can bring to this role that will have you be effective in getting done the necessary things that they're looking to accomplish. I've had many companies thank me for bringing to their attention people with differing backgrounds. And they're thankful and actually say, it's great to have a different set of skills amongst my team members. It makes us more effective. It gives us a broader sense for how to approach problem solving. And thank you for being creative. Well, I pass that along to you. If you can make the case for how you can accomplish the tasks that they have on hand with the skill set that you have, I say go for it. Now, don't hear these recommendations as you're going to get replies to every time you reach out to companies, because be prepared that there is such a thing as a black hole out there. You really oftentimes don't know if your resume is being reviewed, if it's being seen, if the job that's posted is real, or if it's just posted externally while they know internally who they want to hire. I'm not looking to discourage you from being out there and applying. You really should apply. As we keep saying, it's a numbers game. But I want you to be realistic that you're not going to get a lot of response to these types of resume submissions. Yeah, keep in mind, it only takes one. Now, before turning to the last slide, let me address key words and the use of language in the job descriptions. Note the job description titles, note the language that they use, perhaps some keywords. Do make sure that it, those words exist within your resume. 
the wonders of word processing makes it relatively easy to substitute a few of those keywords and phrases. I know I said we were going to cover the application first, but let's take a moment to dispel imposter syndrome. It's remarkable how much this comes up in the work that we do and how often people, when they let down their guard, will talk to us and say, I suffer from imposter syndrome. I'm guessing most of you know what that means. For those of you who don't, essentially when you feel that you're in a role that you don't deserve, that for some reason people think you are somebody that you're not, and ultimately you're going to be found out. It occurs generally when people think that they might be in over their head or don't necessarily have what's capable of getting the job accomplished and done. We've seen this in people from one year of experience all the way up to C-level executives. Let me start by saying it's normally not an accident that you're in the role that you're in. There were other people that were determining that you were the right person for that job based on what they knew the task was at hand and actually your experience. Now, I'm sure you can make an argument saying, well, what if I don't have the experience that they're looking for? Well, it could also be that nobody has that experience or they feel that your unique approach and knowledge within that organization will accomplish this task better than taking somebody from another organization who has done it, but not necessarily within the scope of what they're doing here right now. Your organization did not put you in this situation to fail. They have confidence in you. And if they put you in this situation, more often than not, they want to give you the tools and surround you with the support you need to get the job done. Don't be afraid to ask for it if they are not giving it to you. When they put you in this situation, it doesn't mean necessarily that you are a one-man show. You need to be able to communicate effectively, have confidence that your voice has resonance, and you should have confidence because they put you in this role and they want you to dictate what you need to do to get things done. Generally, the best positions to be in are ones where imposter syndrome may crop up. Why? Because they're a challenge. They are allowing you to grow. You are in a position of a lot of responsibility. So by accomplishing these, you are actually making great career leaps forward. It's our experience that over 90% of people succeed in these roles, which is probably about the same percentage of people who succeed in roles that are not nearly as taxing as these and are much more conventional. So trust yourself, trust you have the support around you, enjoy the challenge, and concentrate on the work at hand. You've done your preparation, you've done your research, you've done your outreach, and now we get to the application process. If you've taken the steps we talked about earlier, you're in good shape because most of the hard work is done. Remember that your resume is a living document. You will want to customize it for every job that you're applying for or almost every job you're applying for. And it may often be just tiny tweaks you need to do with some of the language or wording or reordering your bullet points to prioritize one over the other. Matter of word processing, oftentimes more than anything else, unless, as we've said before, you need several different resumes for radically different types of jobs. Secondly, customize your cover letters. Make sure they are addressing the firm that they're going to. Make sure they are talking about the specific role you are applying for. Nothing vexes me more than when I get a cover letter and it references a job not with its specific title, but one that's not used in the job description itself. It speaks loudly of a standard cover letter that's sent to every company without any thought given whatsoever as to really caring about the position or the company itself. Take a multi-pronged approach when you are applying. Go online through LinkedIn and see if you have people in common with anybody who works there. See if you have people in common with potentially the hiring managers that are at that organization. A lot of times you can find managers within those organizations that you can reach out to referencing a particular job and apply directly without having to go through HR. And keep track of where you're applying. People that you are applying to, in some cases, some of the research you're doing that you're not even using currently, but may want to use a little bit down the road. So in closing, be open. I like to say, if in doubt, send it out. Wayne Gretzky, the greatest hockey player that ever lived, said, I missed 100% of the shots that I didn't take. So go out there and take shots. Remember, it's a numbers game. The more places you show up, the more chance you have of finding a suitable opportunity. 
one of the things I didn't mention earlier when you're presenting yourself for jobs is just as often as you don't get brought in because you don't have enough of the qualifications they're looking for, often you're not brought in because you have too many of the qualifications they're looking for or have different experience than what they're looking for and they think you might be bored in the job and they can't deliver on what you're looking for in your next position. So it's not about the value of you as an employee, it's about how appropriate you might be for the particular role, that organization, and the given situation that they're looking to fill. It is not personal. And I throw in enjoy the process, and I'm sure people are saying, "Ugh, how can I enjoy this process? But if you look at it as an exploration, an opportunity to find out a bit about yourself, uh, you may evolve in the course of looking for a job as far as opportunities or potential career pathways that you might take. You'll get an opportunity to meet with different people and maybe within different organizations. Those are all valuable experiences that might come into play as part of your journey, which we talked about earlier, which makes up your professional narrative. And by getting back to professional narrative, perhaps we've come full circle. All right, that was amazing and a lot of information. And we did warn everyone that there was gonna be a lot of information in this presentation. I'm gonna jump right into the Q&A. So the first one I'm gonna ask is, is it necessary to sign up for LinkedIn Premier Features in order to land a great career? Hmm. We don't use Premier because we have recruiters so that we kind of have Premier as part of that. But what we've been told from people who do have it is that it does not seem to help much. I, I can't really give you a whole lot of good data on whether it pays or not, but anecdotally, we see no real good evidence for using it. You know what it entails, what it adds to the- yeah, I'm not totally sure. I, it may add something, I, you know what, LinkedIn changes all the time, so <laughs> what, it what it allows you to do changes also. Um, one of the, if it allows you to send more direct messages to people, that might be worthwhile, but I'm not sure if it does. Hmm. We'll invite our viewers, if anybody's using um, the premium, um, to go ahead and put some of your comments in the chat if somebody has that experience. And I'm going to go on to the next question. We'll address uh, it on Friday too, Michelle. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, this is the question, how do I know which skills are absolutely required? required for a role versus which are only preferred. I think that came after your comment in your presentation. Um, they don't want to waste time applying for jobs they're absolutely not qualified for, but also don't want to rule themselves out too early. It's a, it's a best guess. That's where we say, uh, or, you know, when you're looking at, when you're looking at the, the overall job description and you say, well, I have applicable skills for this particular role, you can make the case and the hiring manager can either see that or not see that. So you don't know because you never know who's reading, who's on the other side of these things. You also never know what the makeup of the department is, what's what strengths the other people might have within that department. So when they give you five things that they're looking for, two of them are more critical than the other three. So in that case, it's this is if in doubt, send it out, you know. I, I will comment that it seems to be pretty well documented that if men read a job description and they have like three to five of the 10 things that people want, they're like, good, I'm in. Women look at it and say, oh my God, I'm missing one, I can't apply. So there is absolutely a gender sort of um, difference here. And it it's hard to- As it's really, well as personnel. As well as yes, personality, for there sure. There is a gender difference, but, but there's a personality in, difference. In truth, you really don't know exactly what the person on the other side typically wants most. Some position descriptions now do say this is required, this is preferred. Although um, it doesn't matter. But even then it's it might bypass matter. because if you have many, if you have more right. of the preferred than the required. You still um, and can get hired. The, the, you know, the uh, example I gave of that one technology that they put yeah. in required, they're not, they're, you know, they're not that diligent. Um, and a lot of people are not very skilled at writing um, position, descriptions. position descriptions and they're not very skilled at recruiting so they put everything in the world in there and then they wonder why they get no response or they get a response from people who are totally inappropriate because they don't know how to write a job description that doesn't 
help you know it doesn't help you but what you but want to be able fact. to do is if the job is exciting to you and you feel that you're appropriate i'm of the mind that make your case in your cover letter tell them why you'd be an asset in this particular role and what you would bring to the organization and and send your resume along thanks um there's a question here and this comes up actually quite a few times in job talks from um, should I submit my resume for every job that I'm interested in in a specific company if I want to work for that company? Like, are there any negative um, things that can happen by, I mean, submitting for too many jobs within one company? It depends on the company. Okay. I, yeah, I would say you want to be careful not to um, shotgun it or would it be would it be machine gun it? In other words, you don't, if you're doing that, if it's a company you want to work for and there are that many appropriate jobs, then you might want to be very specific in particular about jobs that you're pretty damn appropriate for. If it looks like you're applying for every job across the board, it's like, then it, you look like you're not discriminating at all. So, kind of gets right. you know, if it's, it's if a tricky question, it's kind of case by case and you have to really evaluate who the company is on the other side and what it is you're applying for with them. It, you can be negatively viewed if you if you do what Jay is just suggesting and, and sort of blindly apply to a lot. And you gotta be careful if your cover letter is the same cover letter that you, and, and you're using it to apply for, for a multitude of different types of jobs. Then it's like, what are you really interested in? Are you just interested in a job or are you just interested in working for that particular company? Can you appeal to, um the hiring person um, to consider you for for jobs because you're interested in that company? Can you write a letter to them saying, I'm very interested in working oh, for you and to definitely. not specifically apply for a job? Absolutely. But, but, but remember, tell them why you love them. And, <laughs> right? and why you would be good for them. Exactly. Both why you, what, what makes you interested and why you're a good fit for their organization. And it's not so if you can give specifics about the organization, about their their um, mission, if it's that you believe in their mission and you can align why that, if that's important to you or or their reputation or having. But you want to give specifics as opposed to, oh, I just want to work for you because you are the biggest bank or whatever. Right. Or everybody yeah. wants Spotify. Like that's yeah. not that's not sufficient. OK. Um, should you apply for a job when salary doesn't work for what you're looking for? Can you negotiate at the interview or is that just bad practice? Depends on how far off you are. Um, it depends on whether you're going up or down. <laughs> so you know, Let's not, say it's too low. Let's say it's to be too flipped. low. If, if, if you apply for a job and you go in there and, and you apply for a job and they say, this is paying $80,000 and you come in and say, well, I'm looking for one ten. That, mm -hmm. that probably, they'll probably get really, really annoyed at that. So, I mean, you know what the range was? I'm wasting my time because it's not like I'm going to sell them and I'm just so much better and whatever. Most organizations don't have that flexibility. And if they have that flexibility, they'll put the higher salary in there and consider people at a lower salary um, mm -hmm. or with less experience. But it's a really, it's really hard. When I say it depends on how far off you are, that's exactly what I mean. If you're if it's five if grand, really if it's ten grand. Range, and and don't forget, total compensation is not just right. salary. Right. So what else you might not, you might be okay with a slightly lower salary if the PTO is excellent and the benefits are really you might save money in the end if your benefits are better. Yeah, bonus so bonus and, opportunities and, benefits and stock equity, options, 401k match. There's a lot that goes into total comp and I wouldn't um I would so I wouldn't overlook that and I wouldn't just look at salary, but if you need a certain dollar amount and to you know for your life and you're off by more than a couple of thousand dollars or at a higher level, you know, some increment Probably you cannot. I have search. I have so do, I'm doing a search for a university right now, and I have somebody who I, I talked to who's excellent, and and salary the targeted salary is 165 thousand. They said, well, I'm kind of looking for more. I said, okay, what do you mean kind of looking for more? And it came out, well, I'm really looking for at least 200. I said, thank you very much. That's probably not going to happen. Not not in a rude way. I just said, no, yeah. they can't stretch that much. They can probably stretch maybe five, maybe ten. I think I don't know. It would be worth pursuing. But if you want, if you're looking for 200,000, you're in a different 
neighborhood yeah, right. and it won't and then it, then it's a waste of time so it, it depends on on the given situation that was the same so the same concept because this comes up too goes for negotiating how how much you can be work from home okay. so if you're if yeah. you're looking for a job that's fully remote and you're um interviewing for a job that requires hybrid three days a week, you might be able to negotiate one or two days out, yeah. out of that, but you're not going to get fully remote most likely. Right. So, you, you know, be, be, be aware, be aware of what the parameters are. This is, that's a great segue um, for people who can't move for a job. Do you have any advice for finding remote jobs? Also, is it harder to get hired for a remote job if you're making a radical transition such as working in a research lab, like from working in a research lab? It depends. So I wouldn't necessarily yeah. say it, yes, it depends yeah. on the job, but remote jobs are, you know, so the world has been wildly elastic here, right? In 2021, companies were loath to allow people to work from home. Then they started getting a lot of people, a lot of turndowns. And lo and behold, in 2022, everyone jumped on the remote bandwagon. Well, 2023 started to bring about layoffs and corrections. And sure enough, in 2023 and 2024, we're seeing a lot of companies who are saying, no, we really want people to come in at least a few days a week. So remote is becoming a little less available if you absolutely cannot relocate. You know, you look for jobs in your geography and stretch maybe a little further where you'd only have to go in once a, a month, perhaps, um, or once a week, and that might be doable. If you need something fully remote, you just need to look for jobs that are advertised as fully remote. One thing, one thing to keep in mind is if you're applying for jobs that there's not a large talent pool, yes, you're more likely to be able to work remotely. If you're going into a, a really mainstream industry where, like, if you want to work in New York in fashion and work remotely, forget about it. why bother. You know, like you better be Yves Saint Laurent if you want to do that. I mean, so so the key is if you are tra if if you're transferable skills and you're applying for things that are in great demand then you stand a better chance. Also, you stand a better chance if you're applying to companies, and this may be a hint, look for companies that are in locations that don't have large talent, uh, pools. talent pools. Right. So if, if some company is located in, in rural Iowa and, and they're looking for somebody who's more often found in a large urban center or research triangle, they are more apt to say, I'll take somebody remote who has you know great skills. That's a good point. Thank you. That's a, I, 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 I try to make one every webinar. <laughs> That's so I'm gonna um I'm gonna suggest that this be our last question just because I think I think we're getting we're almost to 115. How do I get the attention of an employer since I there are two questions I'm gonna ask. How do I get the attention of an employer since I only have entry level experience? Should I hire a headhunter? And the other <laughs> question is. How do I work with a recruiter? So I thought maybe in the next three minutes or so, you could kind of walk us through that. <laughs> so here's here's the myth buster that I was going to start Friday's job talk off with. Okay. You cannot hire a headhunter. You know, headhunters work- There are some people who take your money. Be careful. Well, but... very, very few good people in, in executive search and, or any kind of search other than talent agents for Hollywood, you know, actors and sports athletes really work on behalf of the candidate. Most of, almost all of us work on behalf of a client. We are paid by a client to find a person. I have yet to meet anyone in career coaching, anyone in recruiting who works for candidates to find them a job. It just doesn't work like that. That's just the way the, the world works on in this. Um, so you, the uh, we, yeah, marketing a candidate is next to impossible. Uh, there, there are rare occasions when I've had a candidate that I know of, and I know of a company that might be interested in their particular skills, and I have a deep relationship with that particular company, and I'll present the candidate rare. and I can pull it off. But to, when we get a call from somebody to say, Oh, I'd like you to find me a job, we say it doesn't work that way. So we'll give them advice, we'll coach them a little bit on, on how to go about doing it with regard because I know. 
you want to wrap up, Michelle, with regard to the entry level person. Remember, when, when you're hired as an entry level person, you're hired as somebody, and I know you find this hard to believe, as somebody who doesn't know anything. All right. You have the requisite skills to do some research, to do some writing, to to be able to to have some discipline about what you're doing, communicate maybe effectively. You've had some good internship experience. That's yes, right. but for the right. most part, you're going to be totally retrained. Right. So when you are applying, one of the things you want to apply, one of the most important things is that I'm I'm serious minded. Uh, I am I am reliable. Uh, I have a lot of energy. I'm dependable because a lot of entry level jobs require total training and people get intimidated because they see a job spec, which is trying to scare off those people who don't have confidence in themselves. And sometimes they really do need somebody who's not 100% new to the workforce. But obviously, here's something we, we talk about in a previous webinar, every single one of us got our first job. Like there's not a person working that didn't get their first job. They may still be in it, but they didn't get their first job. And if you missed our webinar last week on resume writing, focus on the professional narrative. That's the piece that's most important for most entry level people. And focus on transitions when we talk about making your case, because you can make your case. If you, if you see an entry level job or a junior level job, somebody with a year of experience, and then you read the, the requirements, the requirements are like one year doing something and but not even doing anything other than like answering phone calls or, or whatever. Um, if you say, hey, I can do this job, make the case and apply. Come come Friday, let's talk Friday. Yeah, yep. I was just gonna say, mm -hmm. we, we can talk everyone, you um, the people who are on the call still, we invite you on Friday to come and ask your specific questions to Barbara and Jay. It is a two-way conversation in Job Talks. We do not record those conversations. So we thank you again, Barbara and Jay, for today's presentation. And we also look forward to the following weeks, which will be our last one. I can't believe how quickly it's gone, but um, we look forward to it. So thank you again for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Welcome to our March Madness. <laughs> we'll see you Friday. Bye-bye. <laughs>